Hello and welcome to Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie, now brought to you by Killer Podcasts, an evergreen podcast network. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. This is the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hi, Caroline. Hi. What was that about? What was that new intro about? What did I just say? I don't know. You said it, Sean. Uh, We are on a network now. Yeah. We're members of a network. We've been courted by one of the big networks. Uh, Yeah, I mean, they did ask us to join. Uh, This is Killer Podcasts. It's a new kind of subsidiary of Evergreen Podcasts that's mostly focused on true crime, paranormal, and uh, everything that we do. Everything you like. Like Everything I like, No, I mean, listener, if you're listening to this, (laughs) everything you're into is over here at Killer Podcasts, so... um, Spread your arms out. Take a look around the place, our new abode. Uh, We welcome you in, and uh, we're going to introduce you to some of our new friends over the next couple of months. Yeah, and if you want to check out more about Killer Podcasts and the other shows on the network, you can go to www.killerpodcasts.com. Other than that, nothing about the show's changing. You'll just hear us say that at the beginning, because they're really, really, really kind. Yeah, and and we didn't want to change anything, so that also helps. Now, this week, Caroline, you already know what we're here to talk about. Because mm-hmm. we've been talking about it for three weeks already. We're here to talk about axe murders. Specifically, we're getting into the second half of um, The Man from the Train, or, um, well, I, we said it last episode, I'll just say Paul Miller who Bill James and his daughter Rachel believe is the one who committed that murder in Villisca, Iowa in 1912. Among many others. Now, what we know Paul Miller did is a murder of a family of three in Brookfield, Massachusetts, all the way back in 1898. And last week, we led you through a number of very similar crimes that happened between 98 and 1906. At that point, the axe killings seemed to stop, but there were a lot of very similar um elements between all those crimes that seem to, at least in Bill James's head, connect them to the crime in Villisca. Um, what did you think, Carrie? Did you think it was uh, compelling? Absolutely. Some more than others. There's a couple that I think might not have been related, but otherwise, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of the same MO for sure. Yeah. So, and especially when you look at that Brookfield murder to the Villisca murder, mm-hmm. I thought the similarities were pretty... Um, pretty interesting and uh, obviously take a look back at next week and give a listen if you haven't yet because um you'll be a little at sea here if you haven't heard the first part of this story Mm -hmm. now when we last left paul miller and again remember no one's actually seen paul miller since 1898 when he was headed down the road carrying an axe and go (laughs) maybe not carrying an axe (laughs) yeah just (laughs) Just over his back with like a little bindle with a handkerchief Oh, hanging from the axe? Yes, of course. (laughs) Um, He was last seen headed for the train after his employer's family had been murdered. Hmm. That man was never seen again, and every time I say... Well, never knowingly seen. They didn't... Yes, if he was seen again, he wasn't using the name Paul Miller. Exactly. Um, Paul Miller vanished after that. And so every time I say Paul Miller did something from here on out, it's because we're working under the assumption that these crimes... Um, or many of these crimes were committed by Paul Miller, including the one in Villisca. And that's how Bill James is interpreting the data. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. The trends. Because it's it's a lot about trends. The murder of a, of a family by an axe, as we said last week, and I think the week before, is a, a vanishingly rare crime. Thankfully. Yeah, it's for the best. Now, where we left it last week was a bit of a hiatus for Miller if indeed it's Miller we're talking about. Because the Jameses could find no crimes between July 13th of 1906 and March 6th of 1908 that seemed even tangentially related to their killer. Um, And as we told you last week, we believe that that is because he was probably in jail. Mm -hmm. Um, There's any number of things a vagrant or a uh, train tramp would have been picked up for and could have been held on around this time. Um, And it's possible that he was breaking into a home and just hadn't done his um, horrible crime yet when he was caught and arrested for burglary. But we are speculating. Now, there are two crimes in 1908 that Bill and Rachel James seized upon. I'm really not sure 
that these are part of our string, but they do have some of the elements. Um, in March, on March 4th of 1908, the Hart family, just a couple, two people, were killed in Fraser, Georgia. Uh, Warren Hart and his wife, both killed with an axe. Um, the newspaper reports are very vague, so it's not clear that it was the blunt side of an axe, even. Mm-hmm. And this is a small family compared to a lot of the ones we've talked about. Um, however, the murder did happen near the train and in a lumbering area. So um, Bill James figured it was worth noting. But actually... Uh, Maybe it's like his version of a little snack. Well, I think the Jameses disagreed on this one. Like, oh. Like Bill thinks it was probably the man from the train, but doesn't have enough um, information to say for sure, whereas Rachel thinks probably unrelated. Interesting. Trouble in paradise? I think the only reason Bill James thinks the Hart family was killed by Paul Miller is that on April 12th of 1908, not too far away in Watuaga, Texas, uh, the three members of the Gurel family were killed. Uh, an M.F. Gurel Again, these southern newspaper reports are fewer, further between, and sparser with information a lot of the time um, in these pre-1910 killings. And it's also, these are small papers. These aren't like the Washington Post, the New York Times. Exactly. It's the Watuaga Gazette or right. whatever. <laughs> so all we have is M.F. Garrell, okay. or Garrell, uh, who was a railroad foreman, was killed along with his wife, Dora, and their baby. Mm. Uh, one newspaper said that there were two other children in the house and that they had witnessed two men with clubs murdering their parents. But that was only mentioned in one newspaper. Hmm. And it is it is weird. I mean, Bill points out, and I don't know if he's grasping at straws to try to connect this back to the, because obviously if it was two guys with a club, that doesn't sound like... Definitely not an axe murder. Paul Miller. Um, so we know that the Gorels were bludgeoned, but uh, if it was two men with clubs, that's not Paul Miller. Bill James does point out that, like, if two guys are murdering the parents and the baby with a club and then two children catch them in the act, they're it's weird for them to just run away at that point. Yeah, you kill the kids. I mean, usually this guy doesn't have trouble doing that. Right. So, I don't know. That's a strange detail with that story. But because of the proximity in time and place, I think, to the uh, murder in Fraser, Georgia... I think Bill James just, the, you know, sees it fitting part of his pattern. Especially since the man uh, from the train had been killing in the South before he got locked up. Mm. I think it's more likely that he wasn't out of prison until 1909. Because after the murder of the Gorel family, the Jameses don't tell us about another family murder until September 21st of 1909. And that's another year and a half later. Which seems like a bigger break than this guy usually takes. Well, you you can't commit family acts murder in prison. So that's where I think he was. When he did get back to it, it was in Hurley, Virginia, I believe, on September 21st of 1909, when a George Meadows was found outside of his cabin with his skull crushed and two bullets in his torso. Hmm. Meadows' head had been nearly cut off with an axe, and the cabin was burning behind his body. Lamp stuff again. Oh, this is definitely him again. And setting a fire. He loves setting a fire. Mm -hmm. Meadows' mother-in-law, Betty Justice, was the owner of the cabin. She was found inside. Her body had been brutalized. I think she'd been hit at least once with the sharp side of the axe. And um, That's another thing. It's usually the mom. She had been bludgeoned to death with the um, blunt side of the axe, and the head was found lying a short distance away. The axe handle was missing. Hmm. George's wife, Lydia, and three children, Will, Noah, and Lafayette, were also found murdered inside in their beds. Yeah, I think this is his, probably his first time back. Um, it has so many of the, of the uh, uh, similar patterns. And um, in the resolution of this investigation, unfortunately, also some similar patterns. Oh, no. The town lumber mill shut down so that all of the men in the town could dedicate their time to forming a posse and searching for the killers. That'll go well. So 300 men followed a team of bloodhounds that was looking for the killer. Picture 300 people following a couple of dogs. 10 miles across the mountains from the scene of the murder. I mean, have you seen the Wiener Dog Nationals? <laughs> uh, to the cabin of one Silas Blankenship. 
Silas and his two sons were outside when they arrived, and they uh, ran into the barn, grabbed their shotguns, and stuck them out through, like, you know, murder holes. And then a um, six-hour standoff proceeded with the crowd trying to lynch these three guys. I I have to ask, are they white? They are white, and I don't know if you even say lynch when it's not. It seems like, especially recently, that term's been applied only to racial killings. Yeah, I'm not sure. It seems to me any kind of a mob killing would be a little but i'm not I'm, I'm not sure in any case uh the that's what the mob had in mind uh and the blankenships ultimately had to negotiate with the police like okay we'll come in quietly but you have to protect us from this mob um they were ultimately dismissed there was literally no evidence tying them to the crime instead a well notice how differently that went because they were white uh that's true and ins- i don't think the police would have given a shit if they weren't Unfortunately, local black lumber foreman Howard Little wouldn't be quite so lucky. Oh, God. He was arrested for the murders. Um, Now, Little had currently been fooling around with a local married woman uh, named Mary Stacy. Uh, Little himself was also married. And so Mary Stacy and his wife both kind of really jumped on testifying against him. Oh, Jesus. Very quickly. He'd also once been convicted of a murder before. And he'd recently borrowed a revolver from a friend of the same caliber that was used to kill George Meadows. Maybe the most damning piece of evidence used in the trial against Little, a newspaper boy said that the morning after the murders, Howard Little had bought a paper from him with a bloody penny. It was uh, supposed that Little had done Did this. Did he have this bloody penny? Or no, just... he didn't have I the bloody penny. I the, saw the blood. It was on the penny. Little's wife told police that wives weren't allowed to testify against their husbands in court at this time, or that was the common interpretation of the law. But Little's wife told police, um, like off the record, that Little had done the murder, that he had done it to steal money from the uh, Meadows family, and that she could show them where the money was hidden. She never followed through. Interesting. Little was executed on February 11th, 1910. Based on nothing? Based on a, a, a paper boy saying, oh, I had a bloody, I had a bloody nickel, I did. The money was never found. And in fact, I think there was money in the Meadows home as well that was left out. And Little maintained his innocence until the end. Jesus. And this isn't that, like, I want to emphasize, this isn't that long ago. You know, we're not... It is over a hundred years ago. But it's really, like... <sighs> Culturally, it's not. It's, it's the modern. It's not that long ago. It is the modern world. It's the post. I mean, mostly post-industrialized era, and we still have, <laughs> we still have things, you know, mob justice and things like that um, going on nowadays. People getting shot for having candy in their hand. Um, people getting put in prison because they shouldn't. Uh, lynching was just made a hate crime this week. It makes me sick, to be honest. Like this isn't this isn't that far away from where we are now. We can't look at this with any sense of it's moral superiority. Superior, yeah, exactly. Because there's still people like this in this country. Oh, you didn't. There's mean... still too many people like this. Yes, I agree. Okay, so I agree. And, with you. and the law, the law is not that far away from this. You didn't mean in time. I'm saying we are over a hundred years later. We should have progressed more. Oh, yeah, exactly. We should have from this point. But we haven't. Just over a month later, there was a similar event in Beckley, West Virginia. So, moving a little bit south again. And our guy does seem to move in slow, kind of, um, every month or every two weeks or every couple, two months, he'll he'll kill someone. um, Probably with the rhythms of his work patterns, right? He'll go to blow into town, get a job, work for a couple of weeks, and then when he gets laid off, have a little fun on the way out of town. It seems like, and this isn't nothing against the South, um, but it seems like he is getting a little less scrutiny on these crimes in the South. Maybe that's because different population density or different kind of media in the South, but it seems a lot easier for him to get away with doing stuff in the South and, and kind of other people getting blamed and such. Well, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that these Southern crimes are also happening earlier and that um, pretty big, I mean, there's big changes happening in policing and newspaper reporting and everything like right now yeah. as the story's going on um, as well as, I mean, in over the course of when this guy's killing 
according to Bill James again, uh, but the percentage of Americans using lumber to heat their homes and therefore having a wood pile and an ax out back will go from about somewhere around 50% to like somewhere around a quarter uh, over the co- course of this guy's murder career. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's all very much of its time and it's all, it's all changing, but I don't think, I don't think any of these police departments were equipped in any way to catch this guy because none of them even came close to what was actually going on. No. And we, we had this, this kind of problem much more recently as well, probably post seventies, um, DNA databases have really helped, but I, I mean, as we've emphasized, people didn't talk to each other, like police departments from different cities, not to mention different states, not to mention different parts of the country didn't talk to each other. Even yeah. if it was like, oh, we have this family annihilation with uh, an axe and a lamp and uh, a lot of weird stuff. You had the same thing. Like, no one's putting it together. Well, and there's no federal agency for it either. There's exactly. no federal police. Mm-hmm. So just over a month later, Beckley, West Virginia, a George Washington Hood, great name. Oh, damn. Um, he was a union veteran in his mid 80s who uh, was living at the time with his sons, Roy and Winfield, his daughter, Almeida, and Almeida's daughter, Emma, who was 12. Mm. Now, uh, Almeida had, I guess, recently come back to the family and come back to Jesus kind of thing. Um, she was an unwed mother. And uh, I can only imagine that had caused some stress with the family. But on Halloween Day... This is another one on Halloween. Yes, there are a couple of repeated dates, and we can talk about that too. Um, On Halloween Day, Almeida and Emma were both baptized at Mount Tabor Baptist Church, the local church that uh, her father attended. The previous day, Almeida's fiancé, Mike Farrell, came by at night and stayed till the early morning. So, um, you know, I guess he was friendly with the family. Although it is possible, there was a rumor, that George Washington Hood had thrown Farrell out that night for being drunk. Hmm. In any case, Farrell had supposedly said he would be at the baptism on the 31st if he could find a clean shirt. (laughs) Okay. It's not clear whether he found that shirt, but he did not attend the baptism. I'm telling you all this because, um, obviously, he'll he'll be a suspect. At 11 p.m. on Halloween, Winfield Hood and a friend returned home after seeing some local ladies for a date. Like, like legit or like a brothel? No, local ladies. No, they were, they had like a social (laughs) event with some local ladies. Okay, well, the way you said it was very hush, hush, say no more. No, but it's two boys out there uh, getting some, getting some tail. Okay. Uh, They found the house in flames. Uh, including the black-owned restaurant that was on the first floor. Mm. The guys set to work trying to break down the doors, but were forced back by the flames. No one could approach the house until after the fire died. And then Almeida, Roy, and Emma were all found in the remains of the parlor. Mm. There was a bullet in Roy's head, but not enough left of the girls to determine their cause of death. The remains appeared to have been stacked in the room. Where's uh, George Washington Hood? He was in the back room, his head crushed by some blunt instrument. The Washington Post reported at the time that Hood's throat had been cut before the fire was started, and that there were more axe wounds to Almeida and Roy's bodies, um, including some with the sharp side. Both of them. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Because it would. It would go along with it if it was just Almeida, because it seems like the mother figure yeah, is the, always the oldest tar- woman in the house. Yeah, is always targeted with the sharp side. Um, this this gun thing is new. I mean, there there has been a, a few of them, but it wasn't involved in Velisca, so mm-hmm. it's it's very like why have multiple weapons? It's just uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, You're like double fisting a gun and an axe? Like, what are you doing? Very strange. Mike Farrell, the boyfriend, and some of his buddies were arrested and beaten, probably badly. It was police in 1909, um, but they didn't know anything, and the crime remains unsolved officially to this day. But it's worth noting, the murder of the Hood family and the murder of the Meadows family in Hurley are the only times... 
a family was murdered with an axe in 1909 in the U.S. Hmm. And very similarly as well. Very similar and about a month apart and with a, a, a spatial distance that makes sense for our And you got an arson, guy. you got a family with a mother figure and children and it's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Now, how long until the next one? It looks like maybe maybe almost six months later in Houston Heights, Texas on March 11th of 1910. Houston electric lineman uh, Gus Schultz and his wife Alice held a party. There was also a three-year-old girl named Bessie at the house and a uh, a six-month-old boy named Sandy that the couple had. We're told Alice was in a tight, low-cut dress at this party. So it showed what, like her clavicle? (laughs) Yeah, because of not a cleave to be seen. Well, I don't know. There's there's a lot of. saucy rumors about the schultz family in any case i mean they seem like a good time whatever was happening with this party um that was the last time their neighbors saw them and her friends who were there and three days later there was no sign of life from the house it was locked up tight with all the curtains drawn and laundry woman maggie nelson found last week's clothes still on the line when she came by and the schultz's two rusty rifles and a shotgun had been stowed underneath the house hmm She called the sheriff, uh, who said as soon as he arrived at the house, he could sense the smell of death. (sighs) When police broke into the Schultz home, two men, a woman, and two small children were inside, having been beaten to death with an axe. The bodies were piled on top of one another in one room, um, but the bloodstains were in a different room where the family had been sleeping. All right, so the stacking thing is new, but it's similar to last time. Alice Schultz was found nude except for a thin nightshirt. Is this is the mother? Yes. Okay. The three-year-old girl Bessie was found almost nude as well, with her head shoved down into the bed sheets. Ugh. There was blood all over the walls. The newspaper said that this was quote the most gruesome of all the tragedies that have occurred in and about Houston. Uh, by the way, Bill James does point this out, and it's true. The newspaper reports of every one of these crimes describe it as like the most brutal crime that's ever been committed in this area. Yeah. I mean, you would hope because they're mostly in small towns and they are, you know, some of the most horrific murders you can think of. (laughs) Yeah. Flies were gathering and the police actually opened the windows to air the place out for a few hours before they started investigating. Because this probably happened the night of the party and this was three days later. Yeah. Now the police thought at first that Schultz had probably found his wife with another man and um, killed the family and himself. Um, Because there was another dead man in the house also who wasn't part of the family. Oh. Turned out Schultz was at the bottom of the pile. The husband was. Oh, so he couldn't have, yeah. And (laughs) Unless he's like, (laughs) they're above him. Right, and suffocating himself with the bodies to die. No, that's not going to happen. He'd also been hit in the back of the head with something very heavy and blunt. Mm -hmm. The additional dead man ended up being Walter Eichmann, who was currently living with the Schultz family and was apparently one of Alice Schultz's several to many lovers. His head was covered with mosquito netting, as we've seen a lot of the uh, um, victims' heads covered in these um, cases. We don't know if it was like open an open marriage situation or a swinging situation or prostitution maybe but we do know that alice apparently got many expensive gifts from men who were not her husband hmm. um obviously the papers were mostly consumed with the speculation around all this scandalous stuff well maybe i mean this guy's living there so the husband seems okay with it maybe they're just a, a groovy groovy couple of people Police said it was likely the killer spent some time in the house afterward. Um, Bill James seems to have taken an inference from that. He says, like, we, they didn't say what they meant by that, but you and I know. Because of the corpse Jenga? No, be like, I think he's saying that they found semen at the scene. (laughs) I mean, that's not my first assumption when, when I hear that someone's spent time hung somewhere? out somewhere uh, like you know maybe there's an indent on the couch or there's this you know maybe he didn't flush or something i don't go right to he must have jerked off in any if case he's spending any time here 
robbery was ruled out because uh, cash and valuables were found uh, lying out in plain sight, which is also a common Mm -hmm. thread of almost all of these murders. The ones where I don't say there's valuables in plain sight are usually because, I mean, some of these families live in like one room houses. Yeah, they don't have valuables, yeah. Yeah. In this case, a bloody axe was found in a nearby well that police decided was the murder weapon. Another of Alice's lovers, a Sandy Sheffield, was arrested in connection with the murder. Um, He had lived with the Schultzes. This is a soap opera. Sheffield had lived with the Schultzes for a few years until their landlord kicked him out because it was, like, too weird. Mm -hmm. What you guys are doing, I'm not cool with. Get this guy out. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Sheffield was at the party on the 11th with a date, a 17-year-old girl. Mm. He's a married man, by the way. Mm -mm. Um, He came back again the following Sunday... And knocked on the door. No answer, obviously. Um, And then he put the cow back in the pasture, because the cow had, as all of these scenes are, you know, the animals are upset. Uh, And he knocked on the door again, and then turned to a neighbor who was watching him and called, Oh, they all must have gone boating and drowned. Which the neighbor noted was a weird thing to say. I th- yeah, I think that's correct. Um. <laughs> he, he later said uh, the family had plans to go boating. Oh, it's still weird to talk about how they're all dead. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, he said they he, must have all gone boating. Period. Maybe they. Dr- I hope they didn't drown. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that second part. <laughs> Um, he ultimately wasn't prosecuted, uh, for this, at least not successfully. We don't have any newspaper reports of him being, um, well, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to convict someone for just being a socially awkward weirdo. Yeah. It has happened, of course. True. <laughs> uh, in this, in this podcast, in this, yes. uh, story, it has happened. I think the Schultzes are a nice scandalous note to end it on for a break. Um, what do you think so far, Carrie? I mean, that one you actually seemed a little less. What do you think about the Schultzes? Do you think this Sheffield guy uh, is is in the frame at all, or is it? Uh... No, no. I think he's just being weird. Um, I'm I'm surprised there's no fire angle, uh, especially if he did indeed spend some time there. Uh, we're not going to see fire much for was the there a lamp involved because Villisca didn't have a fire but it had a weird lamp situation uh, there's no weird lamp situation mentioned here okay um but i think it's probably still the same guy i will the stacking of the bodies is pretty specific mm-hmm. um i'm going to circle back to an earlier episode re that stacking of the bodies question mm. later um but for now yeah let's let's take a break and uh, uh we'll come back i i promise i have I don't know, no more than a dozen grisly crimes to tell you about when we get back. Okay. After the break. (laughs) From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. Welcome back. When last we left you, um, the man from the train, in Bill James's estimation, uh, Paul Miller, or whoever was doing these crimes, uh, had just killed, we think, Carrie, right? Mm Mm-hmm. The Schultz family in Houston Heights, Texas. Uh, That was March 11th of 1910. About three months later, he may have struck again in Marshalltown, Iowa, as on June 5th, James Hardy and his 19-year-old son, Raymond, found their horse Old Kit saddled and bridled in the barn. No one in the family had uh, done this, and they agreed it was weird, Mm -hmm. and that they would sit up that night and watch the barn. Uh, Raymond then went to visit his fiancée, Mabel Starnes, three and a half miles away. He left after supper and came back around 1 a.m. Entering a dark house, he lit a match and found his mother's body. Lavina Hardy was lying halfway off of the couch and bleeding onto the floor, having been bludgeoned in the head. Mm. Earl Hardy, 29, was beaten to death nearby. 
James Hardy, the father, had been beaten to death in the barn. There was a sharpened length of lead gas pipe found discarded near his body. Uh, The newspaper reports described all three as having their, quote, brains beaten out. Jeez. Uh, Raymond was arrested for that crime, but uh, was ultimately released June 10th on a total lack of evidence. Yeah, he wasn't there. Um, Well, he supposedly wasn't there. He had an alibi. Yeah, that's true. But there, but there was some. There was a lot of uh, f- fuckery in this one. With like, he had a bloody shirt or something. And okay. Um, it went back and forth. Regardless, he was released June tenth. Uh, this crime is unsolved. Uh, all over half a year later, in Martin City, Missouri, that December, on the tenth, a concerned mail carrier noticed the Bernhardt family hadn't picked up their mail in a few days. This is a common scene, too. The mail carrier went to check out the house with some workers he found down the road. They found that the dogs were chained up near the barn and hadn't had food or water in days. They were close to death from uh, thirst and starvation. Mm. In the barn, they found a horse straining to eat a small pile of hay that was just out of its reach (sighs) because it was tied up. And in that pile of hay, they found a body. Oh, God. With more bodies stacked and covered by hay nearby. Isn't that like Hinterkaifeck? Yes, it is, Carrie. And we'll talk about Hinterkaifeck later in this episode. Man. George Bernhardt, age 40, Tom Morgan, age 17, and James Graves were the uh, three victims in the barn. All three had been hit in the head with a pickaxe. Who? Hmm? I said, ooh. Oh, I thought you said who. I was like, (laughs) I don't know. That's the point. Um, inside, 75-year-old Emmeline Bernhardt, George's mother, had had her skull crushed by a clock weight, and she was stuffed into a closet. There were uh, bloody fingerprints left outside and inside the closet. Uh, based on the size, police felt it was probably a man's hand, and it was 1910, so that was about all they could do with fingerprints. Now, does Bill James think that Paul Miller is branching out in weapons because not every family now has an axe just well, on hand? In this case, yeah. So it, it, he thinks that the axe is, if there was an axe, this guy was going to get an axe because he was uh, probably, almost certainly, a woodcutter by trade. Mm-hmm. Um, our friend Paul Muller, Paul Miller was a, uh, described as an accomplished uh, woodcutter. But certainly this guy seems to have been killing near lumber areas and moving around on the railroad. So um, likely swung an axe a thousand times a day. If he can find an axe, that's what he's going to use. But he wasn't bringing an axe to the scene. He was just grabbing whatever was around and killing a family with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just so happens that he seems to, I think he chose houses that had a wood pile when he could, because he could grab the axe. Um, yeah, but there are some of these where some other blunt object was used. And um, Bill James notes, like, yes, if someone's killed with the blunt side of an axe, that's more reason to think it's our guy. Um, but just because they were killed with some other blunt object doesn't mean it couldn't have been him if the other elements are there. Mm -hmm. Um, The Bernhardt family was well off and very private. Um, They hired out from employment agencies for their labor on the farm um, because they didn't trust anyone from the area. Uh, They didn't talk to their neighbors. They weren't very well liked for that reason. They uh, hid all their money in the kitchen instead of trusting to banks. And uh, they would forbid hired help from even speaking to their neighbors. It's too bad because they just ended up getting killed anyway. So maybe you should have enjoyed life a little more. That's right. Uh, I think Tom Morgan and James Graves were both working on the farm Mm -hmm. at the time. Um, The pickaxe that had been used for the murder was found in the barn with the head flown off and the handle covered in blood. A shirt button was found near the dead man who did have all the buttons on their shirts. So it's assumed that came from the killer's shirt. Not that I don't know how much good that does us. The clock weight that was probably used to uh, murder the missus was found in the barn. Mm-hmm. And a strong box in the kitchen was left undisturbed. As I said, they didn't use the bank, right? All of their money was in the kitchen. No one had taken that. Um, while the hired man and the 17-year-old were both killed with a single blow to the head... Newspapers noted the additional savagery with which both of the Bernhards were beaten. There's a postscript to this one. Um, on August 20th of 1916, a guy named Henry Muller and his wife were murdered on their farm in Stillwell, Kansas. 
1916 is after Paul Miller um, would have stopped working in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And um, a guy named Burt Dudley actually confessed to that uh, murder, seemed pretty clearly to have done it, and was lynched by a mob uh, for it. Do you think this was related to the other Mueller murder? Other Mueller murder. I don't. I, I think this, it, the reason I mention it is just because Bill James mentions it, because it's possible this incident being seven miles from where the Bernhardt family was murdered. And um, yeah. It's possible this guy just also did that. Hmm. But it's worth noting because it has so many elements that are similar to the man uh, from the from the train. Here we hit an aside, Caroline. Um, 11 black families were murdered in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi from 1911 to 1912. Mm, that's horrible. Uh, those crimes, um, Bill James doesn't treat as part of the series. They have um, elements that, that are Miller-esque, if you will. Um, but Bill James and Rachel James just give us a quick treatment of these murders in their book because these crimes have all been laid at the feet of Clementine Barnabet. Oh, and in the words of Bill James, people say she, people want to say she did it. I'm not going to argue with them. I'm, that's not what I'm here to do. Um, but he does think maybe one or two of these actually could have been uh, our guy. The times and places certainly intersect. Um, Clementine Barnabet was an 18 year old girl who confessed to the murders of 35 people. What? How uh, have I never heard of her? She was convicted of one murder, and she is a really interesting story. Um, that we are going to circle back to on another episode after we take a very long break from axe murders. Yeah, let's not divulge too much of her story because I'm already fascinated. Right, so let's put a pin in that for now and I'll just say that when we circle back to Clementine Barnabet, we'll have to discuss the possibility that one or more of those murders were committed by Paul Miller. Mm -hmm. But um, given the time, I mean, he would have been in full berserker mode if he was doing all of these, because 1911 was a very bloody time for axe murders. Mm -hmm. Back to ones we do think he may have been involved in. In San Antonio, Texas, the Cassaway family was murdered, all five of them, March 21st of 1911. Lewis and Elizabeth Cassaway and their three kids. Um, San Antonio is the biggest city we'll talk about. Period. Mm-hmm. This guy didn't... Um, oh, and a, a word about... Here's what I want to circle back on. Uh, we've noticed the last couple of uh, houses haven't been on fire. Yes. And you know that the Velisca house wasn't on fire. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that's been chalked up to is the idea that the early murders, the ones in the South, uh, were mostly taking place on isolated farms away from or nearby to a small town. Mm-hmm. Um, starting after he gets out of jail, more and more of these crimes are committed not outside of small towns, but in small towns that aren't big enough to have their own police force. Towns like Villisca, or towns like Marshalltown, Iowa, or towns like Martin City, Missouri. Actually, that one I think was really, I think that was a whistle stop, basically, on, on a railroad line. But these are small communities now that he's killing in. And, and the, the fire might bring more attention. More attention too quickly. Yeah. yeah. So now his his new fun way to do it is just locking up all the doors and windows, uh, and that becomes our telltale. Mm -hmm. But there's enough. It's a gradual shift where there's sometimes that he does both things, and uh, it I it just it's pretty pretty compelling. Uh, it, there's other elements of the crimes that carry through the whole series. You know what I mean? I wonder why he started stacking and then by Velisca stopped stacking. I think moving the bodies around or playing with the bodies, possessing the body, it bodies is something that he did like to do. Um, and there are times that we find one person, often a woman or a prepubescent girl, has been moved mm -hmm. from the place where they were killed while the rest of the family is left in their beds. Uh, we have other times where the whole family is found in one room, even though they seem to have been killed somewhere else. So I think when he had the time, um, he liked having a body to do you know, whatever it was he wanted to do with it, pose it, have a tea party. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's what he was doing. <laughs> he clearly spent a lot of time here. He had a tea party. <laughs> um, so you'll see small towns increasingly in the frame here, but this San Antonio one is the only man from the train killing, as Bill James would call them, in a city. Mm-hmm. 
but it's at the edge of San Antonio, Texas. And it's the it's at the edge of San Antonio, Texas, where the railroad clips the edge of town. Interesting. So it's possible this guy could have rolled off the train, looked around, gone up, small town. He doesn't see the rest of the city extending off in the distance. Mm -hmm. And he does his thing. His thing being mass family murder with the blunt part of an axe. Well, let's see what happened. Maybe it was just a tea party. Hmm. On March 22nd, the the neighbors of the Cassaway family found their doors locked. Upon forcing a window open, a pillow tumbled out that had been pressed into the window. Hmm. Remember in Velisca, all of the windows that didn't have shades were covered with some kind of fabric, pillows, bed sheets, or clothing. Mm -hmm. All five of the Cassaway family had been hit in the head with an axe while in bed. Their heads were covered in cloth. The daughter, Josie, had been picked up and thrown near the foot of the bed after her death. All of the windows in the house were covered with pillows and blankets. Oh, and this is the one. In this case, a newspaper notes that, quote, other conditions found in the room indicated that the murderer was in no hurry to leave. And that's the one where Bill James thinks it means they found semen in the room. Okay. Which, what do you you think of that uh, assumption? It seems like a a leap. Do you think, do you think they're speaking euphemistically when they say other conditions found in the room indicated that the murderer was in no hurry to leave? I it could have been smoked tobacco or something. That, or maybe doing stuff to the bodies, taking your time with that. I think if it's just, oh, I don't know if, if I feel like speculating, but I think if it's just semen, you kind of do your business and you're out of there. Right. You're yeah. Not hanging around your little puddle or whatever. Not, not necessarily an extended project. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Three months later in Ardenwald, Oregon... And this is far away. Yeah. But it is three months in between. The Hill family, William Hill and his wife and two children, were bludgeoned with an axe in their sleep. Uh, Nothing was taken, and clothes had been hung over all the windows, and the house was locked up tight before the killer left. The following month in Rainier, Washington, just Mm -hmm. a little ways away, the Cobol couple... Archie and Nettie Coble were bludgeoned with an axe that had been left in their bedroom, uh, left in the bedroom after the crime. They didn't store the axe in their bedroom. (laughs) That would be a weird choice. Nothing was stolen despite money and valuables being left in plain sight and the covers had been drawn over both people's heads. Mm. Um, Now, when we covered Velisca, we asked, um, when we started covering Velisca in connection to this crime, Part of the question was, why weren't these police noticing the similarities? Why weren't the newspapers noticing the similarities between all these axe murders? Well, they were in a lot of cases. Um, the newspapers in Rainier, Washington, and the police department immediately noted the similarities between this crime and the one in Oregon the month before. Yeah, I feel like it would be impossible to miss. Um, absolutely. And it actually, uh, it all went up to more of a fever pitch when a Japanese woman was murdered uh, also with an axe. Um, the Jameses are totally sure that one's unrelated, mm-hmm. but it just was more fuel to the to the fire in this same kind of period. More axe, more problems. Uh, that's right. Um, that one wasn't a family murder, and we don't think Paul Miller was involved. But if Paul Miller was involved in any of these crimes, he was definitely involved in the double event in Colorado Springs, Colorado, September 17th, 1911. Now, when I say double event, Carrie, what do you think of? Uh, Like a berserker mode situation. Um, But I mean, is there a particular killer that comes right to your brain? Mm, Jack the Ripper. Because we talk about the double event with Jack. Well, we don't, we haven't talked about Jack the Ripper on this show, but those words, the double event always comes up. They felt that he was uh, interrupted during one of his, uh, well, after a kill, but, you know, he liked to play around after that, and he was probably interrupted, which means that um, the, the same night he went and found someone else to um, be a victim because he hadn't been satisfied by the first one. Right. Um, well, Paul Miller had a double event, too. And since Paul Miller's crimes are not murdering a prostitute, but murdering a family it's a lot of work it's a lot of work and that's what the wayne and burnham families found out on the night of september 17th of 1911 the first family found was the burnham family may alice burnham 
along with her three-year-old son, John, and her six-year-old daughter, Nellie Emma. All three had their skulls crushed with the blunt side of an axe. Uh, May and John had both been killed in their sleep. Nellie Emma um, was out of her bed. Husband and father, the family's husband and father, A.J. Burnham, was a tuberculosis patient who uh, the family had moved out to Colorado Springs so he could go to a nearby, um, what are they called, sanatorium? I think they called them sanatoriums. Yeah, the the springs especially were very popular for treatment. That mountain air. Mm -hmm. So people could go to, um, you know, supposedly the fresh air would uh, help clear up your TB. Um, In a lot of cases, it was just a more pleasant place to die. Yeah. As I said, Nellie was found out of bed, and something in the room caused the chief detective to describe the murderer as a, quote, moral pervert. Well, I think we can probably assume from that that's a little more clear cut than, you spent spent some some time time there. Right. (laughs) The blinds were drawn, the windows were covered, and the house was locked up tight. A bowl of bloody water was found in the kitchen where the killer had washed his hands, and a small pile of ashes was found in front of the stove with a partly burned Sunday newspaper. Hmm. Uh, the lower part of a lace curtain on one of the windows, the one they think he probably exited through, was also found burned. Okay, so maybe he tried to set a fire, and it just didn't take. Um, it could be. It could be. Now, some ink was spilled on the way out of the Burnham's window. And there was a pretty clear thumbprint in blue um, <laughs> left on the, on the sill. Very smart. Doesn't help because it's still 1911 yes. and this guy's prints still aren't on record. Um, but it does, lead police be- it does lead police to believe that this was the second crime he committed that night. Mm-hmm. Because if this was the first crime, if he left the Burnham's house with blue paint on his hands, then more fingerprints would have been found next door at the Wayne house. Henry and Blanche Wayne and their two-year-old daughter, Lula May, were found after the Burnhams. Henry was also a patient at the TB retreat and was pretty friendly with AJ. The families would play together and uh, go out together, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All three of this family also found with their skulls crushed with the blunt side of an axe. The murder weapon was found leaning against the Wayne house. So the Waynes were killed first? Yes. Okay. A.J. Burnham, the uh, you know father of the, the, the one surviving member of these two families, was obviously investigated. Um, but it was determined that not only did he have no motive, he was too sickly to have done anything close to murdering six people. Mm-hmm. In both houses, a lamp had been moved and its chimney removed. And in both houses, valuables had been left in plain sight and nothing had been taken. On that lamp grind again. Um, so many of these victims have had company on the days that they were killed. Did we talk about that last week? Mm -hmm. And so it was possible he's watching the families, seeing that they have company that lets him know if there's people home and he's not just wasting his time. How many people? Right. So in trying to explain the double event, it doesn't seem like he was interrupted. And in any case, he only went right next door to do more murders. Mm -hmm. Um, Bill James speculates that he was just so excited by his first kill. That he went on to the next one? It was probably convenient. Maybe the girls were playing together that day and he kind of got a lay of the land. Well, bingo. He also says it's possible if this guy did watch these houses, he could have seen Nellie Burnham, the six-year-old. And if this man was sexually attracted to prepubescent girls... That seems clear. He sees Nellie playing with the neighbors, breaks into what he thinks is her home, but is in fact the Wayne house... And so he, well, I'm not going to waste my time while I'm here. He kills the Wayne family and then goes to the Burnhams to finish the job that he wanted to do in the first place. It's so crazy. Never again would he kill two families in one night. Um, But as we know, this isn't the most victims he would claim since more were killed in the Velisca case and more were killed in the Ackerman family case in Florida as well. Two weeks later, Monmouth, Illinois, the Dawson family was killed. William Dawson, his wife Charity, and their 13-year-old daughter Georgia were beaten to death with a length of lead stovepipe, a weapon we've seen before in this series. Uh, William and Charity's heads were both bashed in their sleep. 13-year-old Georgia was found out of bed. 
The blinds were drawn and the windows were covered, but the back door was left unlocked, which is a difference from our usual um, pattern. Mm -hmm. Although the authors of this book do point out that uh, one newspaper said the neighbors broke in to find the family. So um, in that case, maybe that back door was locked to begin with. But also the Liar Lee family and the Showman family murders had uh, doors that were left wide open anyway. So, you know, maybe it gets interrupted sometimes. Maybe some of these aren't part of our series. Right. But he does seem to be picking up the pace a little bit. Because that was just two weeks after the previous murder. And just two weeks later, on October 15th of 1911, the Showman family of Ellsworth, Kansas... Now, this is a really creepy one, because that same night, the Marshal of Ellsworth, Kansas, Morris Merritt, was up late reading in his front room, which apparently is like literally steps from the railroad track, like Mm -hmm. within 20 feet, and he heard scratching at his back door. So he stopped and listened, but the noise stopped. Next morning, and this is like that old um, urban legend with with the hook or something. Um, the marshal found the screen had been pried off the back window of his house and someone had tried to get the window open. The screen was left leaning neatly against the building. Meanwhile, across town, chauffeur William Showman, his wife Pauline, and their three children, all under five years old, were murdered with the blunt side of an axe. All were found in the room where all of them slept and all of them were found in bed. Pauline's body, um, the wife, was apparently posed in, quote, a disgusting manner, Hmm. post-mortem. And one of the newspapers said that the baby, the youngest child's head, was removed. God. The killer had entered through a back window screen, as Paul Miller always did, and the axe had been dropped in the same room as the victims. It was later found that it had been taken from a neighbor's yard. Finally, next to that axe... A kerosene lamp on the ground with its chimney removed. This lamp ha- stuff. This house, too, was locked up tight on the way out. Now, again, the local papers in Kansas immediately connected this crime to the double family murders in Colorado Springs and the murder in Monmouth, Illinois. Mm-hmm. So people were drawing connections between these things at the time. And there were headlines like, axe crazed maniac on the loose question mark and then just nothing was happening like well, the problem is the it's really hard to investigate that angle and so small town sheriffs then end up working with what they have and following whatever silly local rumor brings them to either uh, arrest a boyfriend or you know in in the earlier and southern more in more southern cases um killing a black man in too many uh cases mm. That's 14 people dead in 14 weeks. It's crazy. Interestingly, Miller seems to have gone dark here for seven months before jumping back into what you could describe as a berserker mode. Maybe another short jail stint. And then if he's going into berserker mode, he's been all pent up. Bill James says the same thing. Could be a minor crime he's picked up for. He spent seven months in jail. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, five months in jail and then he works a couple. In any case, it was June 5th, 1912, before the Hudson family, well, just a couple, Rollin and Anna Hudson, had their heads crushed in bed with an axe or similar instrument. We don't know if this was was an axe. Um, Although Anna's maiden name was Axe. Oh, this is the the one with the the girl that's named Axe. Anna A-X-X-E. I think you mentioned that last week, yeah. Unless there was someone else who had the main name Axe. Well, last last week we had uh, Texas Butterworth. No, no, no. It was someone with the last name Axe. So you, I think you mentioned that one. Um, oh, yes, of course I had. Because this was discussed in the Velisca episode. Mm-hmm. The Paola, Kansas murder was uh, one of the ones that our old friend uh, Wilkerson, the private eye... <laughs> had said was committed by uh, oh what was the supposed hitman's name uh, William Mansfield mm-hmm. remember Wilkerson was trying to paint Frank Jones as having hired William Mansfield mm-hmm. to kill the Moore family um, one of the crimes that Wilkerson had claimed that guy had definitely done was this murder in Paola Kansas the Hudson's heads now we'll get into the details and we'll see if you uh, recognize anything here The Hudson's heads had been covered with sheets. On a box next to the bed was a lamp with no chimney. Lamp stuff. 
There was an open window in the other bedroom, which is a small departure from our pattern. But the screen had been removed, which is how our guy seems to get into the house. Anna Hudson's jewelry was all left in plain sight. And this was just four days before the murder in Villisca. This was the crime, remember, with the pig-faced man? Yeah. The pig- I can't forget that. Pig-faced man was investigated heavily. They never found out who he was. Just a pig-faced man. That's right. Living his life. And then we came to the Villisca, Iowa case. The murder of the Moore family and the Stillinger girls, all eight of them, on June 9th. Mm-hmm. And, well, again, the newspapers at the time connected it immediately to previous crimes. And, well, the... Um, that did tie into the investigation a little bit with Wilkerson saying Mansfield was essentially a serial murderer. They just used it to tie back into the same tactic they were always going to do, which was um, pick a local kind of down on his luck dummy who's tangentially connected and just say he did it so he can collect the reward money. It's possible that the Paola murder was the last crime committed by Paul Miller, if Paul Miller did these crimes, it's possible that the, not Paola, it's possible the Velisca murder was the last crime he ever committed in the United States. Oh, in the United States. It's possible it's the last one he committed. Right. But a few months later, in Payson, Illinois, the Fanschmidt family, Charles and Matilda Fanschmidt, their 15-year-old daughter Blanche, and a 19-year-old teacher who was boarding with them at the time, named Emma Campen, were all bludgeoned to death, and the house was set on fire. Hmm. The crime happened six to eight miles from the nearest railroad. Um, the reason I'm not sure this one... There's a guy named Ray Fanschmidt, uh, Charles and Matilda's 20-year-old son, who was tried three times for the murders... Um, wow. Until the Illinois Supreme Court ultimately stepped in and told the local court to, like, back off, basically. That's enough. Yeah. We're that, done that, here. That's enough, guys. Um, so the problem, the only, I don't know, the only problem with the Fanschmidt murders is there's no weird lamp, lamp stuff. There's no, like, the windows are all covered with um, cloth. There's no, all the heads were covered with cloth. We don't know because the house was set on fire. The house didn't ignite until a day or two after the murder. Hmm. Like, in some reports, neighbors did complain about smelling burning meat yeah. near the house. Oh, God. But it wasn't until like two days later that the house suddenly burst into flames. So it could be, our guy sometimes, our guy Paul Miller sometimes sets fires badly. Right. Uh, or fails to set fires. So it's possible he like lit a fire, left, and then the fire kind of died and smoldered for a few days before ultimately um, being kicked up by the wind and uh, uh, consuming the house. Mm-hmm. But at the time... Um, people decided that that was evidence that the fire was on some kind of a time release fuse. And Ray Fanschmidt was, uh, uh, in the business of dynamiting stuff. Like he would, uh, uh, he had taught himself how to use dynamite and was making a career of just like helping, um, surveyors level road grades and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. And he was kind of a a man about town who was looking to make a, a fast buck in the in the rising automobile industry um so he was just kind of not trusted by uh well sounds like his surviving family members and by the community so uh i don't know ray fanschmidt a lot of the evidence against him had to do with a a track running a certain way along the lawn that people said they knew had to be his carriage interesting because of the weight ratios of like his broken wheel okay it was like local gossip type (laughs) stuff (laughs) Um, so anyway, that was Ray Fanschmidt, but I don't think there's enough elements that we can say for sure that Payson either way. Really won, yeah. Either way. Um, so it could have been Velisca was the last time. Or? Well, what happened after that? Um, Bill and Rachel James are sure that this man was not killing in the United States after this time. They didn't look into uh, records from overseas, however. And they do point out that the Hinterkaifeck murder... I fucking knew it. ...is very similar to a lot of the elements of our Man from the Train murders. It's so similar. And the guy is German? Yeah, he was... Well, he could have been um, Austrian or something. But yes, he had, he had like a German accent. I knew it. Uh, yeah, as a reminder, the maid in that case, Maria Baumgartner... 
had just been hired that day. Um, so she arrived at the house and then was later on murdered along with the whole family. That was uh, Victoria Gabriel, her father, Andreas Gruber, her mother, Kazilia Gruber, her daughter, Kazilia Gruber, and her son, Joseph Gruber two years old. And remember there was all the gossip stuff in that case too, where there was a neighbor who yeah. um, was possibly Joseph's father. Or it could have been her father oh, that was right. the father. The neighbor was legally Joseph's father, but there were rumors yeah. that her father, who she definitely had been sexually abused by, yeah. um, was the possibly the, the father of this baby. And uh, I think when we did the Hinter Kaifek story, go back and listen to that, by the way, but we ultimately came down on the idea that, um, what was the guy, it was German for like sled maker. Oh, I, gosh, I don't remember. Schlittenbauer. Mm. Lorenz Schlittenbauer was supposedly, was the, you know, uh, was the kind of chief suspect. And we agreed that if it was anyone we'd talked about in that show, had to be Schlittenbauer. But you did mention the possibility that it might be someone else. A roving maniac. Mm-hmm. And we... At, I remember Carrie saying, like, I know it, it sounds far-fetched. It seems like a crazy thing to reach for. But um, if there's no clear, you know, you know, motive here, we, why aren't we investigating that possibility? Here we are, Carrie. It turns out, I mean, we just looked at so many crimes. They're so similar to this one. Now, here's some problems. There isn't any lamp, lamp stuff. Mm. But it's 1920. Maybe they're just, um, I don't know if I know how the Hinter Kaifek house was lit. Yeah, maybe they weren't using like a portable lamp. Maybe it could be, you know, like wall gas lamps or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. It was a remote farmhouse, though, so it does feel like... Could be candles. I know it wasn't electricity. Yeah. But the bodies were stacked. Mm-hmm. There's barn stuff going on. We think the we thought the person may have broken into the house. Um, oh, Bill James, by the way, all that... <laughs> he definitely spent some time there, but I don't think there was any semen. And all the, I thought it was so funny, all, all the really creepy stuff about Hinterkaifeck, all the stuff that people talk about, all the stuff we talked about with um, the prior maid had heard voices on the farm and there was a missing key and um, something about footprints or, or something like that. You know, the idea that this house had been stalked for days. Yeah, uh, the prior maid thought it was like haunted or something, but it was really probably just like stalked. Bill James actually dismisses all of that. He says all that stuff's probably just neighborly bullshit that comes up in any crime from this time. Mm. And that the man from the train style was to roll up on a house, maybe watch it for a couple of minutes, and then just... Well, or a day or something. Yeah, maybe yeah, earlier that day, it seems, in some cases. Yeah, it adds to the spookiness of it. Definitely but. adds to the spookiness of it. And, it. and we even have, I think in that case, there was also like a place where someone could have laid in the barn. Yeah, and there was stacking, wasn't there? In Hinder Kaifek? Yeah. Yes. All the, all the family except the youngest... And daughter the, and Kazilia. the maid's head was covered she was left in bed and her head was covered yeah i don't know i kind of like paul miller for this one it's interesting now it's not like there's a unbroken string what i've shown you is not unbroken but a pretty compelling string of similar murders which it yeah and the breaks and it makes sense as short prison sentences right it doesn't make sense to have the break from 1912 to 1920 necessarily, unless he went... Well, maybe there were more axe murders, and Hinterkaifeck's just the more famous one. I mean, we're not getting a lot of news from outside of the country, certainly not about just like random murders. And certainly not random murders from 1915 to 18. Yeah, maybe there were a bunch, but they're all in like foreign newspapers that people didn't ever translate and might not even exist anymore. I don't know. I kind of like it. What about the um, the Axeman of New Orleans? Is this at all related to him, or is that just a completely other guy? Completely other guy. Also adding to the insane body count of the American <laughs> Midwest and South in 1911, yeah. specifically. Axe. 1911 and 1912 were just a crazy time for family axe murders. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be alive in that time anyway. But, so. but the New Orleans Axeman really didn't. There's a, a lot of elements that make it very different from these crimes. Specifically Italians, usually. I think he was killing with the sharp side of the axe. Yeah. Um, it was. I, I, I figured I'd ask, but I, I really like Hinterkaifeck as being related, especially if this could be Paul Miller's home country. Maybe he went, he was like, okay, the heat's too hot here now. And the heat was getting hot, right? I mean, Especially with Velisca, and that's 
Is that his most people at one time? No, the Ackerman family in Florida back in like 1900. Oh, that was like nine, right? Yeah, 1908 or 1909. But yeah, he's getting a lot more heat and, you know, go back to the motherland, kill there for a bit. Why not? 1906, nine members of the Ackerman family. I like him for Hunter Kaifek, I do. It's well, I very don't, interesting. Well, I don't like him at all. <laughs> I don't like him, obviously. So, yeah, we have a tiny, it's very scary. It's a tiny, greasy-haired, very wide, muscly man. Angry at the world. Never been treated well a day in his life. Sees no reason to treat anyone else nice. Has horrible sexual perversions Mm -hmm. that he's stopped trying to fight. Yeah. Has weird lamp stuff going on. Weird lamp stuff. Yeah. Has issues with women, certainly. Not even beyond the the young women that he abuses. Um, A lot of the times the mothers or mother figures are targeted by worse violence. So something's going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, the We don't know anything about his childhood, obviously, because there's no mention of this Paul Miller before or after the Brookfield murder. Mm-hmm. But what do you make of these different um, behaviors? So I feel like moving the lantern, not lantern, lamp specifically around the house is both practical to see what he's doing, but also weird and ritualistic, right? Yes. Because um, he didn't grab a lantern, you know what I mean? He and didn't... it changing and, and modifying from place to place, you know, sometimes he lights the fire, sometimes he doesn't. I mean, it all makes sense to me when you're doing it for this long. And the you did you did see, as I did, right, how the fires kind of die away as he's moving into towns. Exactly. Yeah. And then he starts doing the lock up the house thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but but the lamp as a common element through the whole string, the victim's heads being covered with cloth, that I think is practical too. He's just stopping some of the splashback. Yeah. Uh, the house being sealed up tight, you know, that might make it a little longer till somebody breaks in. But it might just be that he it. has privacy doing what he's doing, especially when it comes to noise. Um, yeah. And he he likes to take his time, clearly, so... Yeah, and there's lots of um, lots of serial murderers who like having and playing with bodies afterward, almost to the point that that's their that's the reason they did it. Mm-hmm. So there you have it: the man from the train. The man from the train. Bill James takes a moment in the book to ask uh, whether this man was a coward or not. I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters either. Uh, he is doing something cowardly. Sure, murder is always cowardly, right. but well, and especially I don't. I don't really give a shit why he's doing what he's doing. It's still terrible. Yeah, it is. Um, and what do you think about the idea that this went? I mean, this book was written in 2017, mm-hmm. and the Velisca murder was 1912. Yeah, it's remarkable that they got this amount of evidence and corroboration on this stuff. Um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and listeners, if you have, I listen, I've, I'm obviously completely in love with this book and I may be in love with Bill James. Hey. Um, so if you have any other thoughts, like if anybody, I, I would love to hear holes poked in this uh, theory. That's, that's sort of what I'm putting the, the, the call out for. You love to hear holes poked in any theory. Uh, but for me, I don't think that all of these murders were committed by the same guy, but I think a lot of these murders were committed by Paul Miller. In all likelihood. I do too. And that is, um, Bill James calls it created knowledge. Hmm. Like how, um, for the longest time, nobody knew what a dinosaur was. That's the example he gives. And now five-year-olds know uh, a bunch of different kinds of dinosaur. Mm Mm-hmm. You want me to name some? No. Like T-Rex. Everyone knows that one. Stegosaurus. Brachiosaurus. Plesiosaur. Plesiosaur. Stop. It's crying saucers. 
via ABC Channel 23 News in Bakersfield, California, one viewer was left mystified after reviewing doorbell camera footage only to find a peculiar object zipping through the night sky in front of his home. The man, Bakersfield resident Tim Harvey, captured the footage in the Hagen Oaks area via a ring security camera. Why is nothing this fun on my news station? <laughs> In the footage, a bright object whips through the sky extremely quickly, leaving behind some kind of trail reminiscent of a short-lived contrail. So, not chemtrail. <laughs> uh, it's what, what is behind uh, planes, but it didn't remain in the sky. Chemtrails aren't even worth doing an episode on, right? I'm sure we will at some point. It's a funny conspiracy. But anyway... According to ABC 23, to which Harvey sent the video, the Bakersfield Police Department and the UFO Research Center have been alerted and both are stumped by the video. Ooh. Uh, do you feel like the UFO Research Center is often saying they're stumped? <laughs> well, UFO expert Scott Brando has dismissed the video. Okay. Which he contends is simply showing, quote, another insect mistaken for a UFO. Oh, that's interesting. Now I want to see it again. Yeah. And um, you can find this on ABC 23 Bakersfield on their website, and you can find it on Coast to Coast, the that a website. That's just where I usually get my news anyway. The, the anchor. No, for, for this, not in general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I scroll through um, uh, MSNBC and CNN, uh, um, Coast to Coast, obviously. <laughs> the biggies. Uh, the biggies. The big three. <laughs> um. Let's see. And he, uh, Scott Brando also said that its trail is just a known artifact, which I don't know what that means. Some on the Coast to Coast Facebook page additionally theorize that it might be ball lightning, After Effects video editing, fairies, a meteor, or my favorite, quote, George Norrie's mustache out for a night on the town. Well, that person was having fun. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, definitely check out the video. It's very interesting. The anchor um, loved it. He, he was like, look at that. Look at that thing. He's like, right there. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> uh, yeah, get at us uh, on what you think it is. I like, I like the idea of a flying mustache, but um, who knows? Yeah, maybe it give you, maybe it'd give you a ride. No. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary, and check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com/slash Ain't It Scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and also now on Spotify. We'll be forever grateful. We certainly will. And keep an eye out for, we're finally back updating that Patreon content. I mean, we've been. We have been. But, yeah. But I mean. New mini-sode coming. Yeah. Life. Official mini-sode, not our, our offshoots. I feel like we keep saying we have a glut of content coming, and, and we do. It's all written. It's just been a very hectic. Uh, Guys, uh, we're exhausted. We, we're doing our best. We don't get paid to do this show. <laughs> as long as we, we're getting you the main episode and some content on Patreon, we're happy. But we're doing our best. Yeah, and uh, to that effect, there is a pretty long uh, mini, I don't know how mini a 40-minute <laughs> episode is, about uh, Donald Crowhurst and the Tenmouth Electron. If those words make no sense to you, come join us on Patreon. It's a really <laughs> weird story. Special thanks, by the way, to our beloved top-tier patrons. That would be Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. We love you guys very much. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can check Kyle out at his YouTube channel. Music is a verb. Ain't It Scary has brought... <laughs> this is new to me. Time. Ain't It Scary has been brought to you by Killer Podcasts and is a production of Longboy Media. Hit it, Poe! <laughs> From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. <laughs>